You live with what? It is sometimes the only question to ask in amazement when you see the exotic and even dangerous animals that some people live with. Another question might be, uh, why? Is it ego that makes some people think they can tame the wild kingdom and bring it home for dinner and bunking privileges? Here's Jay Shadler. Come on. Tigers in the kitchen, bison in the family room, monkeys at the dinner table. There you go. Bears in the pantry. And this guy has seen it all. You don't have to go to Africa to see a lion. You don't have to go to India to see a tiger. You don't have to go to uh, Australia to see a Taipan, a deadly snake. You just stay any city USA. They're here right now. Tim Harrison is a policeman, fireman, and paramedic all rolled into one. His home ground is here in central Ohio, but he's rescued exotic animals all over America. I got called to a residence because a large boa constrictor had escaped. It was loose in their house. The gentleman said the snake is loose in the walls, and they were just freaking out because the woman that lived there was an invalid in a wheelchair. And that snake was in her walls 28 days. Tim's work is the focus of a remarkable documentary called The Elephant in the Living Room examines the strange obsession some Americans have for bringing deadly creatures home with them. That way, we filmmaker Michael Weber. The fact that we're so mesmerized by a tiger, or a chimpanzee, or a lion, it is what should be to their benefit. But instead, because we're allowed to do it, we will take them and we'll put them in our home and we'll obsess about them and we'll try to turn them into something that they're not. Yeah, I'm here, though. <clears throat> to find out why we do this, let's take a fascinating journey into a most exotic place. Call it the American psyche. Ego gets involved here, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, big time. And you think about it, too. You know, you, you don't want to admit that you've done something wrong. You know, here you brought this animal into your home. You do love it, but you're going to love it to death. <laughs> We recently rode with Tim on a house call to Denise Flores, whose 400-pound Bengal named Taz has a tiger-sized toothache. It'll need surgery, the kind one of his cage mates recently underwent. See, Taz's upper tooth here, you can see it's dark and it's like broke, and that's what we're gonna get fixed. Three other big cats also live here in Denise's backyard practically within a paw's reach of the lazy cornfields and Amish buggies passing down the road. Like many big cat owners, Denise fell in love with a very little animal. The trouble, of course, is they grow up. It's a tragic end to a woman's life. A tiger she owned turned on her. In less than a year, a cuddly cub can become a lethal predator. And then you got a problem. Then they realize they got a, what I call a baptism in reality. And it's just too late then. Truth is, you simply can't take the wild out of a wild animal. Well, when you bring a large predator into your home, you might as well just turn, turn on a time bomb. Do you regret in any way having exotics? No. No. I love these guys. The connection that these people had with their lion, with their tiger, even with their venomous snake, far surpassed the connection that a lot of us have with our dog or cat. And some kind of primal thing happens when a wild animal that could kill you and should rightfully kill you actually has a connection with you and you feel like you mastered that. In Weber's documentary, the Lions by far has been, has been uh, one of the best animals that I've ever owned in my life. No one personifies the poignant paradox of owning a wild animal more than Terry Brumfield. Yeah, I caught a lot, a lot of flack over having a lion in the house. I, I was uh, immature, plain stupid. To help battle his own depression, Terry and his wife took in six lions, including a cub named Lambert. <laughs> yeah. What's the matter, buddy? Uh... Terry, who even began to look like a lion, considered himself the leader of this junkyard pride. But tragedy was stalking. Gotta be something that's uh, going to all just this. happened. Lambert. A malfunctioning refrigerator electrified Lambert's water and cage. Come on, Lambert. He died. A little bit of Terry died too. Back on the road with Tim, we learned that somebody's Black Panther is now roaming the woods near Akron. Somebody turned it loose. It's that born free thing. They can't handle it anymore. They can't pay to feed it. 
So what they do, they think, we'll take it out to a wooded area and turn it loose. It also happens with alligators. That's right, alligators in Ohio. I have 19 alligators in the Dayton area, just in the Dayton area, that people have turned loose or couldn't handle anymore. We have 10 in the Cincinnati area, that's 29 alligators. That's more than they had nuisance alligators in most counties in Florida. It's estimated that there may be as many as 73 million exotic animals in the U.S., with tens of thousands of dangerous reptiles, primates, and big cats being kept as pets. And Tim believes you can draw a straight line from people's passion for these creatures Woo! to that other great American obsession, reality TV. There's nothing closer than running a zoo in your backyard. <laughs> Before reality TV started, when people started bringing animals, you know, on TV in yep. their homes and showing you how to live with them, uh, I got maybe four or five calls a year. Well, the tail's going to be the hardest part. For a python loose or a bear, maybe a tiger. All of a sudden, it blew up with over 100. Because you'll see whatever's on TV that month, it's popular, will be for sale in those animal finders guides the very next month. Who are really the guys with the black hats in this story? The breeders and the dealers are the ones with the, the black hats. Take it from a police officer, it's just like dealing with drugs. Yeah, we got license from kind of from all over the United States. We got Florida, Maryland, New Jersey, New York. At an exotic animal fair in Pennsylvania, Tim and his filmmaker go undercover. Here we got some uh, venomous snakes over here. We got uh, rattlesnakes. Here's a gold copper here. Tim says it's at events like these where the exotic pet owner often gets their first fix. Just like a dealer would. Here, here, here's a little marijuana. Here's a little drugs. Here, take that with you. Hey, it's free. Free. Here, hold this tiger cub. Hold this tiger cub. Guarantee you, you're going to take it home with you. Yeah. Because you got that animal in your hands. Same principle. You're going to get hooked. If Tim sounds a bit like a reformed pet addict himself, ironically, he is. I was a, a huge offender. Huge offender. Really? Till, yes. I've had lots of tigers, bears, uh, venomous snakes, all different stuff over the years, and I actually thought I was doing the right thing. But on a trip to Africa, he had a most memorable conversion. I went to Kenya on an expedition, and I was stunned. I'm looking out, and a herd of giraffe run past. And then we got to see a lion later on, and I realized this isn't right. They do not need to be in cages, and definitely not people's backyards or in anybody's home. These animals need to be left in the wild. That's where they're supposed to be. And it just changed me. I had goosebumps thinking about it right now. And if you want one more chill up the spine, think of this. Remember Terry Brumfield's story? Well, after Lambert's death, Tim convinced Terry to send the remaining lions to a secure animal sanctuary here in Colorado, where they felt grass beneath their paws for the very first time. Retirement never looks so good. If you want to see other examples of how some people are relocating dangerous animals for their safety as well as ours, watch Animal Planet's Call of the Wild Man on Sundays.